So tell us what it's like to play that repertoire on this piano in this hall. What's the, what's the advantage of doing that? This is one of the most beautiful concert halls in the world. Okay, with the wonderful acoustic. Um, it's obviously used in the festival as a premium venue. And in addition to that, it currently has one of the most beautiful new Steinways. It's literally just hot off the press, um, just short of the 600,000th model. So in terms of the acoustic and in terms of the instrument, it couldn't be better. But what's also very special about this place is that um, it was around when Chopin was around them. I mean, the church actually has been standing for about 220 years, probably around about the end of the 1790s it was built, and obviously was a church um, until um, fairly recently, actually. Um, but this is an example of the kind of acoustic that would be very applicable to the kind of repertoire that Chopin was playing, fairly intimate repertoire, designed not for large concert halls, but really for smaller gatherings, um, which was Chopin's upbringing and was the tradition for concerts in the early 1800s. So the repertoire suits the medium, in a sense, of this, this, this beautiful hall. Although it has to be said, of course, because it was a church, um, it wasn't um, probably on Chopin's radar when he was actually staying in Edinburgh in 1848. He, he did play both in Glasgow and in yeah. Edinburgh and in private houses. Yes, yes. Yeah. What, mm. what, what do we know about his approach to performance uh, and what do you, as a, mm. as a, a mm. pianist, mm. What, can you tell me a little bit about how you relate to mm. how he would have performed mm. and how you prepare yourself mm. for performing his pianist? Chopin basically... Um, began playing the piano by extemporization, by improvisation. That's how he started. He wasn't even formally taught. He was formally taught composition, but in terms of piano, he was given free reign, which is why um, the technique, which is why the experimentation with what the piano can do is so remarkable. Um, and Chopin liked to extemporize better than to compose. He found composing a real problem because he couldn't really recall the kind of things that he was doing in extemporization often for, for hours on end. Um, and that freedom is um, very present in the compositions, which is not to say the compositions are structureless, but that's what attracts me. And also the intimacy, therefore, the fact that Chopin would really be at his happiest practicing by himself, improvising by himself. And next to that, in the company of of good friends. Um, and it's very interesting, by the time it got to his trip to uh, Scotland, he was terribly weak. I mean, he weighed less than about 90 pounds. He had to be carried up and down stairs. No energy, and because, of course, his, um, his body was so weak and feeble by that stage, emaciated, it was very difficult for him to make him a, a larger sound. He was never known for being a large, concert-style pianist in the manner of Franz Liszt, for example. Um, so by 1848, the sound was very small and very, very intimate. And actually, he uh, played in a very large uh, concert hall in Manchester after Glasgow and after Edinburgh. I think there were around about a 1,000 people present. And he was absolutely horrified because he said, you know, they will not be, they, my sound will be lost and I won't be able to communicate with the audience. So essentially, Chopin is an, is an, an intimate, intimate composer, yeah. Um, there are other things about Chopin which are completely revolutionary and um, which stand very much in, in, actually in opposition. He is famous for being an intimate, very intensely romantic poet of the piano. He's a lot more than that, actually, and he's not just a miniaturist. Um, although possibly he's at his best in, in smaller, complete forms. Mm. We've recorded you today yeah. playing, as you say, the yeah. most modern, modern and modern. beautiful instrument. Yeah. How would the pianos that he played mm. when he made a trip to Scotland mm. and played in a different hall in, in Scotland, how, how has that, the instrument changed and how has that influenced a soloist preparing these pieces and performing. Yeah. Well, essentially, you've already mentioned it. The modern instrument is 
infinitely more powerful. I mean, it's, it's not just uh, wider in terms of the keyboard. It goes much, much higher, much lower, well, considerably lower anyway, than a contemporary instrument, um, contemporary to Chopin. So essentially, there's the, the volume of sound and also the um, heaviness of the uh, attack of the, of the, of the keys um, is much deeper and much more varied. Essentially, Chopin's piano, the pianos that he was, he was familiar with, Pleyel and Erard, and later Broadwood, who was actually a local man made good in terms of making pianos, um, those pianos were much, much lighter to play. Um, I mean, you needed a much, much lighter technique, which is difficult in its own right. And that sort of tends to get lost a little bit today because we are using modern instruments. This ability to play very, very light and very, very gossamer, uh, filigree, um, very fast pa passage work is very demanding for modern pianists. Whereas for Chopin, it was a lot easier to play light, in a light fashion and very quickly. And in terms of the, the crossover between improvising, extemporizing, mm -hmm. and, and, and following the score, mm -hmm. um, do you think modern, or, or do you think that influences modern Chopin uh, and people who are performing Chopin in order to get mm -hmm. the feeling of the music? And yes, I think it's come full circle. I mean, Chopin, of course, is infant. In infinitely the most influential composer for pianists, for performing pianists. I think even, even if we're brought list into the equation, it's Chopin that all pianists regard as being very special um, in this rep in, in 19th century piano repertoire. Um, I think um, after Chopin, things tended to get a little bit um, too free in terms of interpretation. People thought, because Chopin essentially was an extemporizing composer, they could take their own ideas and their own additions actually to the score. And I think we've come up full circle from that now. There's, be, there's now a respect for the score itself because the score was something which was very, very precious to Chopin. He spent a lot of time very angrily writing out and writing out again what he meant on paper. And so with the move of what's called the Urtex movement, actually getting back to original editions and actually looking very scientifically, scientifically at what the, it, there is, this has sort of informed pianists, I think, in, 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 a, new, in a new way, in a, in a more authoritative way. Although, you know, we tend perhaps now to hear performances which are so much bound by the, 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 the information on the page, perhaps there is a little bit of leeway back into, in terms of the way that pianists were performing Chopin 100 years ago or 50 years ago. His trip to Scotland was very much a kind of coda. It was very much mm. at the end of his life, mm. at the end, uh, and mm. uh, he's written a little bit about it. He, he was here in the autumn uh, 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 of 1848 mm. and a bit miserable at times mm. when he was here. Mm. Do you think, th 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 what do you think we can learn by going back and looking at what he played and how he felt at that very mm. twilight period of his life. Yeah, I mean, it was, as you say, a really... Uh, the, Chopin actually came over to Britain because of the fall of the monarchy, the, uh, the fall of Louis Philippe in 1848, the 1848 revolution. So he was basically escaping. And he was, of course, a monarchist. He was very conservative. And um, because all the <laughs> Polish aristocracy and French aristocracy w had moved, very much in, in, in to London and to Britain, he was basically following them in the hope that he might actually have some commissions because he didn't have very much money. He was also terminally ill by this stage with tuberculosis. And um, Chopin had actually stopped composing well before 1848. The last, there is a mazurka, which is around about 1848, but it's a very, very sickly, very, almost non-piece, the greatest pieces, the, the masterpieces came around about 1845, 1846. So he was on his way out very, very slowly. The, the relationship with Georges Sand, of course, had deteriorated. Um, and that, I think, added very much to his psychological state. There is this connection, of course, with tuberculosis that it does affect very much the the psychological health of the, the sufferer, there's the a tendency to depression, to intense melancholia, which Chopin had 
anyway, I think, even before he was, he was physically so ill. And um, <laughs> in Scotland in, in, in October in 1848, it was very misty. Um, I think he was in a carriage ride, which overturned, and, you know, I mean, he had a really rough time. I'm, I'm surprised he survived another year, considering the privations he had to, he had to suffer while he was here. <laughs> That's perfect. Okay. That's great. That's, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.